Depending on your political perspective, Evan Bayh is a rose among thorns or a weed in the flower bed. Either case, he's blossomed into the Indiana Democratic Party's hottest political prospect, perhaps since his father was Speaker of the Indiana House and went on to become a United States Senator for three terms. Our guest today is Evan Bayh, Secretary of State for some two months now, and we'll talk to him today about the election, about democratic politics, and about the Office of Secretary of State. Also with us is John Rouse, producer of this program and a member of the political science faculty at Ball State University. Welcome, Evan. I, I dropped your father's name in there. The comparisons are inevitable. Uh, how do you compare yourself with your father, philosophically, politically? I mean, you're both Democrats, but sure. philosophically, where do you come in? Well, I agree uh, with a lot of uh, my father's uh, philosophical views about uh, trying to help people uh, make it in this society. I'd say if there's a significant difference between myself and my father, it's probably uh, in the financial area, and that probably has to do with the fact that we grew up at uh, different points in time. Uh, I grew up uh, in the 70s and uh, have now come to public office in the mid to late 80s when it's quite clear that uh, our resources are not limitless and that every government program needs to be justified as far as cost and expense is concerned. So I'd say if uh, if there's one difference between myself uh, and my father, it's probably that I'm fiscally uh, a little more conservative, uh, but I think that's a result of just uh, the different generations uh, in which we've come to political maturity. John? Uh, the Secretary of State, what exactly does a Secretary of State here in Indiana do? John, there are several very important functions in the office of Secretary of State. Uh, I am the chief election law official in the state of Indiana, and I'm sure we'll be talking about recounts here before the program's over, and that's part of that responsibility. Uh, the Secretary of State oversees all of the corporations in the state of Indiana, mergers, acquisitions, things of that nature. And we have a new corporate statute here in Indiana, which will help us uh, hopefully attract uh, some business and industry. I oversee and appoint the Securities Commissioner, who regulates the sale of stocks and bonds, uh, franchising, things of that nature. So those two things are very important uh, uh, business-related uh, uh, responsibilities. And finally, uh, I oversee uh, and regulate the lobbyists who seek to uh, influence our legislators in Indianapolis. Uh, in addition, uh, I think that I have a responsibility as the third uh, highest elected official in the state of Indiana to speak out about a number of other areas when I feel that my voice can be a force for uh, better government here in the state. And I, uh, during the campaign, and, and since I've been elected, have not hesitated to do that either. Those are the uh, four major responsibilities directly within the office, and the fifth is uh, uh, one that I feel that uh, I, as an elected official, need to uh, carry forward. How do you prepare to be a Secretary of State, and, and what, are, what surprises have you seen in the two months you've been in office? Well, Larry, I think that uh, some business background helps, and I, my undergraduate degree was in business economics. I practiced law for several years, uh, during which I had uh, some business experience. I was uh, intimately familiar with the election laws because I made that a special area of study and made myself familiar with that area of the law. Other than that, uh, I think just a general background in public policy and an interest in uh, government uh, is something that's important to bring to the office. I'd say that uh, uh, of the surprises that I've seen so far, uh, have been relatively few. Uh, I thought that uh, uh, the pace of things might slow down some after the campaign. Uh, to be honest, uh, my wife Susan felt that maybe I'd be home a little bit more. But it hadn't worked out that way. Things have still been very hectic, uh, but very enjoyable. And uh, I've been very happy with the, our ability to really make a difference in several important areas. And uh, so in that respect, I'm very happy with the job. In the past uh, six elections, uh, the victories statewide, 25 of the 27 positions or spots have gone to Republicans. Otis Cox, of course, won four years ago, and then he lost recently. What did you do to be able to get elected, to be one of those uh, uh, out of 27? That's a good question, uh, John. One thing that I did uh, throughout the campaign was that I emphasized common sense, and I emphasized uh, good government. And I tried to stress those ideas like election law reform, protecting people's right to vote, like eliminating waste and mismanagement in government to save our precious tax dollars, that I felt uh, both Democrats and Republicans and independents could support. And I stressed over and over again that uh, ideological labels uh, weren't that important. Whether you called an idea a liberal idea or a conservative idea wasn't so important as whether the idea was, would work, whether it made sense. 
And I think that Hoosiers appreciate that kind of uh, common sense, practical approach to government. Uh, they appreciate uh, people who aren't uh, strident, who try and uh, establish a consensus rather than uh, divide us. And I think that that was one of the major uh, ingredients to our success. Uh, in addition, I worked very hard, as did uh, my family, my wife, and my supporters. And uh, you know, a little elbow grease never hurts either. So I think, I think the message, though, the message was the key ingredient in our victory. And the message was common sense, a responsible government. Because there was a buy in the race and a Bowen in the race, it was probably the most highly publicized, highly visible race for Secretary of State that Indiana has ever seen. Is that good for the state, good for Indiana politics? I think it was, uh, Larry, and I think the reason that it was was that it focused people's attention on both of the candidates. It made them aware of the race, and I think it got them ultimately beyond our two last names. Uh, the hardest thing you can do in public life, the hardest thing to do in public life, is to get people's attention. And I think the race did uh, capture people's attention and therefore uh, allowed people to focus on what we were saying and not just how we happened to spell our last two names. And I think that's important. And uh, I was happy that ultimately we were able to get to the issues. The, the Democrats, as I said, have not done very well as of late. Why do you think the Democratic Party has not been able to put up more viable candidates across the state? Well, that's uh, something of a chicken and the egg question, John. When, uh, when one party is so dominant as the Republican Party has been in Indiana for some time, uh, it makes a lot of people in the private sector who are looking at uh, some of the personal sacrifices, some of the financial sacrifices that are inevitably involved in public service, uh, think twice about running because they not only think about the sacrifices, but they think about the very real question, can I win? And too often the answer to that has been uh, uh, no, The people have not felt that they had a, a, a viable opportunity to win. And uh, that has made it hard to recruit good candidates, which is unfortunate uh, for both parties. It's unfortunate from the public standpoint. And getting back to your uh, previous question, uh, one of the things that I emphasized during the campaign was the need for competition in the political process. Uh, someone might not always agree with me, they might not always agree with my opponent. The important thing is that there is a debate, that uh, ideas are floated, new approaches are brought forth, so that the public can judge for themselves and choose those ideas and those candidates who they feel are best for the state of Indiana. And when we don't have good candidates coming forward because one party is so weak, or conversely, if the other party is so strong, I think it hurts us all. And I think that in, to a large degree, people looked at my candidacy and said, here's an opportunity uh, to elect a Democrat uh, who's talking about common sense, who's talking about restoring competition uh, in the ideas and public, uh, public service, and uh, therefore they voted for me. But uh, it's a chicken and the egg problem. Yeah. As long as one party is so weak, it's hard to attract uh, good candidates. Does your victory signal any sort of turning of the corner for the Indiana Democratic Party? Are things changing? Uh, I mean, the party's been ill, uh, trouble raising funds to finance statewide campaigns. Uh, do you see any change at all in that? I think so. I think that this election demonstrated uh, something that many of us have uh, believed for some time, and that is that Hoosiers are fundamentally independent people. They'll vote for the individual uh, rather than just the straight party ticket. And it's never been demonstrated as well as it was in this last election. Uh, the race at the top of the ticket uh, was 21 percent uh, in favor of uh, the Republican Party. And my race was next on the ballot, which was 8 percent in favor of the Democratic Party. That's 30 percent of the people who were splitting their ticket back and forth. That large of percentage has never occurred before. And I think that it shows that when we are able to attract good candidates and stand for the right kind of ideas, we will win our fair share of elections. We were able to raise a, a significant amount of money. Uh, and I think that's because we were talking about common sense ideas. And I think that uh, in that respect, we have turned the corner because a lot of those potential candidates will look at this election and say, gee, uh, I have a chance. If I work hard, if I talk about what I believe in, I can win. And we'll recruit more good candidates and therefore win more elections. If, if I could follow up with that thinking, um, it's been said that you are a textbook Jeffersonian Democrat. What is a textbook Jeffersonian Democrat? Well, that's a, a good question. That's not a phrase that I used, uh, although it may be one that applies. I think that it probably refers to the fact that I believe in uh, helping individuals and that the basic role of government uh, is to 
uh, assist with things like education and economic development that, are, that allow the private sector and individuals to make the most of their lives rather than believing in an all uh, seeing all powerful central uh, governmental authority. Uh, I believe in uh, uh, fiscal responsibility and balancing the budget and eliminating waste and mismanagement. I think Thomas Jefferson was a very prudent individual in that uh, respect. And uh, I guess you could say I'm something of a populist. Uh, I believe in helping people and I'm a little bit suspicious when any area of our society gets too much power and has too much control over our lives. I'd rather my trust is basically with the people, and I'd like to see uh, uh, government help people and not take power from them. You, uh, excuse me, Larry. Does this imply that Republicans or certain Repu Republicans do not assist people? No, I don't. Uh, don't uh, wish to uh, cast any stones uh, of that nature. I do think, however, that uh, uh, my own philosophy and that of many Democrats is to uh, help people at the grassroots, and then business flourishes and society flourishes when people are doing better. And uh, I think that that may be the difference between a, a trickle-down so-called concept and a building from the grassroots up concept. But uh, I've tried steadfastly to steer clear of those kind of uh, stereotypes. And uh, I didn't uh, mean by that that Republicans don't mean to help people. Mm -hmm. You said that you think people are tired of politics as usual, that uh, we need to restore the public's faith in the political process. What's wrong with the political process? And is it unique to Indiana because of its highly charged political atmosphere? No, it's not unique to Indiana. We uh, do tend to be a very partisan state, which is something I think too often hampers providing people with good government. And that's one thing I did stress in the campaign. Um, whether it's a Democratic idea or a Republican idea isn't so important as whether it's a good government idea, whether it will help people. And I think that we need to get beyond those labels and concentrate on helping uh, people. Uh, have, providing the best government which we can. That's what's important. So I have de-emphasized the partisanship uh, in my own campaign and in my own tenure thus far in office. Uh, by politics as usual, uh, I mean uh, politicians, government officials who focus on their own narrow interest or their own party's interest at the expense of the public interest. I think when people see that happening, uh, they lose faith in the process uh, because they don't elect us just to help ourselves or just to help our parties. They elect us to serve the public as a whole. And that's what I mean by politics as usual, getting away from the focus on the narrow special interest and concentrating instead on the, the broader general interest. And in the recount, I think you saw a good example of me putting that into action where we had a, a panel that was uh, two Democrats and one Republican uh, by applying the law, by trying to do what was right and fair, counting people's votes, uh, ultimately, a conclusion was reached that benefited a Republican candidate. And uh, that was because uh, all three of us on the panel wanted to do what was right and not just what was expedient. And hopefully that will begin to change some of those perceptions of business as usual. We'll get to the recount in a minute. But is that view that you've expressed, um, it's called in this one article, uh, a little bit of idealism. Is uh, Given the fact that you're the only dem elected Democratic executive in the State House, given the fact that Republicans have for years had overwhelming majorities in both chambers of the legislature, although it's rather close in the House this session, is that w more wishful thinking? Uh, is that just idealism? I don't think so, Larry. I, uh, I am something of an idealist. I always hope for the best and work for the best. But I'm also a very a pragmatic individual. What matters to me is not so much philosophical concepts uh, as is making real progress. I want to do what's going to help people, not just theoretically, but actually uh, in our daily lives. And by stressing good government, uh, I think that uh, ultimately that will be good politics, which will help do away with politics as usual. Because when we stand up for what's right, I think people will take notice. And they'll support candidates like myself who take that attitude. And even some of the uh, adherents to politics, as usual, will sit up and take note and say, gee, we better get on with uh, the business of the state. Otherwise, we'll be at risk at the polls. And so I think that uh, in one respect, uh, my idealism and emphasis on good government is also good politics, because I think that's what people want and uh, ultimately will lead to practical results. If I can follow up on that phrase, what people want, one big issue, of course, here in the state is education. Education in the sense of how do we get from where we are now to some place better than we are now. As a leader, 
how do we change the thinking of the average citizen? The average citizen that says, I no, want no more taxes. I want something for less, something for nothing in a sense. How do you as a leader go about making these changes or to lead the people to say, we can do more? That is a very good question, uh, John, and a very tough question. Uh, let me say first that there is no such thing as a free ride. Uh, you get out of life what you put into life, and that goes for education and many other things that are important to us all. Uh, let me mention two uh, broad concepts that I think can help lead people uh, to a realization that uh, education is very important. First, I think we need to talk about education in terms of an investment in the future, an investment in our own lives, rather than just purely as an expenditure. Uh, any kind of economic development program that is going to make sense in this world that is much more technical, much more sophisticated, has to emphasize a good education program, whether it's retraining of our current workers who are displaced or whether it's preparing our children for the next generation of high, highly technical jobs. Uh, it's an investment that will pay off many-fold if it's done prudently. So I think we can begin to shift the dialogue in that nature and, and uh, have people think of it more in terms of something that will reap returns, both immediately and in the long run, rather than just something that's a, a net loss, taking money out of their pockets. Secondly, and this is something that I've emphasized uh, uh, for over a year now, and I'm emphasizing once again in my office, and I'd be happy to talk with you about some specific steps we've taken, uh, I think we need to talk about efficiency in government. Uh, we need to reestablish our credibility, and by our, I mean, I'm talking about uh, public figures in general, with the public so that they no longer throw up their hands when we talk about taxes and spending and say, oh, they're just wasting our money. We need to institute programs that make government leaner, tougher, more efficient. We need to eliminate the perks in state government to save tax dollars. And I think when we take that kind of hard-nosed, uh, efficient management uh, uh, attitude towards state government, people will stand up and, and take notice. And they'll, they'll say, well, whether it's Evan Bayh or it's someone else, that these people mean business that when they propose an expenditure, it must be because it's worthwhile, and they're not wasting our money. And I think that when we've reestablished our credibility with the public, they'll then be more uh, receptive to proposals for increased spending. So those are, those are two ideas that I have. Now, are the political party people going to come behind a focus upon merit, because don't they stand to lose from this kind of exchange? Do you mean merit hiring, John? Well, I mean, for example, one of your concerns was an e effort to make sure that everyone that worked in your office passed some sort of merit exam. Yes. H how do we get this kind of change to occur in a society that is very much focused upon politics and patronage? How do we get people to think in a different kind of way, to focus upon expertise and skill and can the job get done by whomever? Well, uh, to the public in general, I would say that that is uh, in their best interest that we are dedicated to hiring in our office, and I hope uh, ultimately that all state government would adopt this philosophy, only those people who are competent and qualified uh, to hold those jobs, to serve the public. Uh, I think that's in the public's best interest. To those partisans uh, who might disagree with that uh, uh, merit competency approach, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, once again, uh, good government is good politics. When people see that uh, those candidates who stand for good government are those who are winning at the polls, uh, they'll swing in behind that approach. And I'm confident that that is uh, the case. I think that is a, a major ingredient to, in my success uh, just this last November. Indiana is, I think, perceived as a rather conservative state, miserly budgeting. Has that been unwise over the years when you look at our per capita spending for education, when you look at the, the needs that apparently exist now uh, to shore up our infrastructure in terms of roads and bridges? Uh, has it been unwise for Indiana to be so miserly over these years? I think uh, fiscal prudence is very important, uh, Larry, and I would... Uh, take some exception to the term fiscally miserly. I think that uh, perhaps we should have been investing more in education and investing more in, in economic development, but there are some areas where we have uh, been wasting taxpayers' dollars. There are some areas in which we can be more efficient and really have an austerity budget, which I am in favor of. Uh, for instance, one of my first acts in office was to give back the free car that was provided to the Secretary of State. Since then, I've given back the free insurance, the free license plate, uh, the free gasoline that's provided to all state officials. I haven't had the fancy gold embossed stationery that costs hundreds of dollars every year. 
Uh, we haven't uh, used the watch line for personal calls in our office to save the taxpayers money. I don't think that that's right to, to use it for those purposes. Uh, we've tried as best we can to save the taxpayers dollars. We've had uh, a prominent accounting firm, nationally known accounting firm, come in, they agreed to do this for free, and have an extensive efficiency audit in every uh, branch of our operations. So that when I propose my budget to the General Assembly in just a month or so, we will be able to have a real dollar savings over the previous budget that was in effect in our office. So I think there are some areas in which we could be more miserly, in which we could save more money to put into things like education, to keep the amount of the tax increases to a bare minimum. Um, so the answer to your question is both a yes and a no. State government can do better as far as saving the taxpayers money, uh, and yet we need to do better also in investing in important areas like education. I might mention that uh, on my behalf, a bill has been introduced in this session of the General Assembly that would save $2 million without raising anyone's taxes, and that is from an immediate uh, reform of the license branch system, which I think is very important. Uh, and uh, if nothing is done, we will let $2 million go down the drain, uh, which will benefit no one but the political parties. If I can get back to leadership and also public service, which is a key aspect that you've emphasized, a, a poll in the Wall Street Journal indicates that young people in college, freshmen, they don't have a philosophy of life. In fact, in 1967, something like 83% of those freshmen entering college had a philosophy of life. 1985, only 43% did. What would you say to these people? I mean, these people who are in college, who are looking for a philosophy of life, what could you offer them in terms of hope, in terms of their futures? Well, my generation, uh, John, has uh, often been referred to as the me generation, that we're consumed with commercialism and self-indulgence. I think that's beginning to change, and uh, I'm happy about that, because there are some serious problems facing our society. And unless uh, those of us in uh, this generation of Americans are willing to uh, invest in our society, uh, we're going to be the losers in the long run. What I tell my contemporaries is, uh, first, you're not too young to get involved. I'm 31 years old. I happen to be the youngest Secretary of State uh, in the United States. What that means is that Hoosiers look to qualifications and not just to calendar years. And I think that's important. Secondly, I say to them that uh, your own well-being does not end at your doorstep or the end of your driveway. You can't cut yourself off from your community or your neighborhood or your, your church or your, your uh, school system, that uh, really your well-being uh, is broader than just yourself. And I think that's uh, struck a receptive chord because when government isn't doing the job, uh, very often we let private industry down, and that ends up hurting everyone. So I've tried to take a message of an expanded concept of self uh, self-interest uh, to younger people in particular and I think it's beginning to catch on. You mentioned some specific legislation. What do you see as your role in terms of proposing legislation, lobbying for legislation? Uh, during the election Republicans complained uh, that you were campaigning on issues, making promises in areas where you would have no authority whatsoever. Is the legislative uh, process within, you see, within your duties, your responsibilities as Secretary of State? Larry, I uh, feel uh, fully uh, empowered to work with uh, colleagues of mine in the state legislature uh, to have uh, legislation which I feel makes common sense introduced. Uh, I've done that in the area of election law reform, which is directly within the Secretary of State's office. I've done that in the corporate area. I've also done that in the license branch area, which I think is important because I think the waste of that $2 million uh, is really unjustifiable at this point in time when we're talking about raising taxes and we still have the politicians benefiting from the license branch system. I just don't think it's right. And if no one else is willing to introduce legislation like that, I'm willing to see that it gets taken care of. The reason for that is that I think the public deserves a choice. The public deserves to have alternatives put before them so that they can vote for candidate A or they can vote for candidate B. They can support party A or they can support party B. If the ideas aren't introduced, if someone's not willing to step forward and say, wait a minute, the public deserves a choice, our de democratic process breaks down. And so that's how I see my role, as having introduced ideas that benefit the public. And I think that's a perfectly legitimate function for me to take. My responsibilities as Secretary of State don't end at my office door. And I don't intend to be the kind of public official when you or anybody else comes to me and says, Evan, I have a problem, or I don't think this is right, that I say, well, I'm sorry, you've got to go see the fellow down the hall. If I can help out, I will. And uh, 
That may include introducing legislation outside of the direct responsibilities of my office, but uh, that just means I have a broader concept of what being a public official is all about. In our last couple of minutes, if we can talk about the recount briefly, were you happy that you got the opportunity to get involved in that early on to, so you could show, demonstrate what you've been talking about in terms of eliminating some of the partisanship of government? Well, it was a tough assignment, uh, a highly emotional, uh, very partisanly charged atmosphere. And I think that uh, it was a learning experience uh, for all of us. I think we were able to demonstrate how people working together uh, can reach the right result and not just the partisan result. I think we demonstrated how we need uh, further election law reform. And uh, I think that, uh, yes, it was an opportunity, although uh, it was a difficult one. Uh, I was glad that uh, to have the chance to demonstrate some of my principles in action. Uh, it came with the territory, so uh, uh, I was prepared to handle it. As a Jeffersonian Democrat, Jefferson became president, uh, though I dislike questions like this of somebody who's been in office for two weeks. Do you have some higher political ambitions than Secretary of State? Well, uh, having grown up in a political family, uh, I was able to observe all sorts of people involved in the process. And uh, I always thought it was regrettable when somebody let their ambitions uh, get the better of them. Uh, it was my observation, and something I intend to uh, put into practice, that when you concentrate on doing a good job first, uh, when you take care of the business at hand first, the politics usually tends to take care of itself. So uh, I will always be uh, uh, interested in serving the public in whatever capacity that may be. Right now, I want to just concentrate on being a good Secretary of State. And uh, uh, if that uh, qualifies me to serve in a higher capacity someday, that's for the public to decide. All right. We're out of time today. Thank you for being our guest. Our guest has been Evan By, Indiana Secretary of State, for some two months now. Good luck. Uh, and John Rouse from the Political Science Department has been with us. Thank you for joining us. I'm Larry Law. If you have comments regarding this program, please address them to John Rouse, Box 149, Muncie, Indiana, 47305. The producer for Public Affairs Roundtable is John Rouse. Associate producers are Cecil Bohannon and Bill Mosier. This program is a production of University Media Services the Department of Political Science, and radio and television stations on the campus of Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana.